theapologetics.com radio show, where we challenge believers to think and thinkers to believe. I'm Harry Edwards, your host for the evening, and joining me in the studio are my good friends Lenny Esposito and Dr. Jacob Daniel. How are you guys doing? Doing good, Harry. Good Great. to be Morning. here. Morning, yes. Yes. Well, it's not really our regularly scheduled time, if you guys notice, uh, because John Noyes is just busy speaking, and good for him. Yep. yep. Good for him, yeah. But I'm excited about what we're going to do because yeah. we're, it, we, it gives us an opportunity to do a, a two-parter. That's right. That's right. So we're back next week. But uh, you're right. I'm excited about this new series. We just thought about it a couple weeks ago. But we, we're done with the books for now. You know, we're done with the books. Those were great. But um, I think because of what's going on in um, our lives today, culture, and, and please understand if you're listening— when we say culture, when we say uh, things are changing, we're talking about the West. We're talking specifically about what's going on in America, all right? Mm. Just some context there. But we are starting a new series titled, Does the Church Play a Role in Culture Change? So I want this to to have at least maybe 10 episodes. I mentioned that uh, to you guys not too long ago. And an episode would be we would invite a Christian leader— or a pastor, and they'd be our guests on our show, and I'd like to uh, just throw that out to them. How are they, how, how do they understand their role as a pastor, as a Christian leader in the career uh, that God has called them to? Let's say if a, a pastor is, um, what, how is he leading the church to have an eye toward culture? Is that even an important thing for this pastor? So I, we want to explore together what, uh, I guess, the church around the Southern California area, we're going to target them first because it just makes sense we're in the Southern California area. And it'd be fun. I think it'd be fun if we collect at least 10 episodes of, of this. What is the church doing to affect culture, or maybe they have a different stance on culture. Maybe they stay away from culture, and mm. uh, we'd like to know why that is. You know, maybe they adopt the stance of kind of like in First Corinthians five, where you get the idea of not conforming or not not even being with you know people who are unrighteous. That that type of thing. Uh, and, and I think there might be some churches who hold that particular stand. So we want to explore that together. So again, our series, which we are laying the foundation tonight, we don't have any special guests tonight, but uh, next week we will have the pastor of the church I go to, uh, Jason Kim. He said yes already, so we're going to have him both. L Lenny, you and I are going to be interviewing Jason Kim. And just as a teaser next week, so Jason Kim is uh, the pastor of La Habra Christian Church. There's something unique about this guy. Hmm. He has a YouTube channel uh, where he drives around. Uh, he's an Uber driver, and he will have passengers ride for free if they're willing to listen to the gospel. Hmm. So that's his thing. And he has... So, so I, I'm excited to talk more about what he does with that. Uh, so uh, that's next week. But again, the series is titled, Does the Church Play a Role in Culture Change? But before we get there, I'd like to know, you guys, how are your individual ministries going? And let's talk a little bit about a new ministry that we're all part of, and it's kind of related to what we're we're doing. So yeah. you might actually see this episode in um, the new ministry that got formed not too long ago, and we'll talk about that in the next few minutes. But I want to know what's going on with you, Lenny. What's going on with oh, Come uh, Reason? Well, it's now fall, so we're uh, doing a couple of different things. Uh, I'll be speaking at a uh, homeschool educator's uh, general meeting in Ventura on October 6th, uh, Friday, uh, on uh, basically building up a bulletproof faith in your kids. Is, is how, do we, how do we deal with the cultural changes? In what ways can we help our children become stronger? Yeah, nothing's you know guaranteed, but how, how do we be 
how do we get ahead of this as opposed to being reactionary in dealing with it afterwards? So that's going to be an event uh, put on by the Association of uh, Christian Home Educators in Ventura. Mm -hmm. And you'll uh, be able to go to the comereason.org website, find out more information about that event and where it's happening and things of that nature. And then uh, just preparing for uh, fundraising and things like that. I normally do a... Um, uh, a bike ride, uh, uh, try to challenge, they challenge me to do a good 130 miles. So Which you've be, done before, uh, right? Yeah, it'll be, it's 200 kilometers. Yeah, yeah so you've done that before. Double metric century. 6,000 feet of elevation climbing. Oh, man. So, yeah, in, in one, it normally takes me a little under eight hours, so... <laughs> That's 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 going to be that's going to be fun. That'll happen at the same time. So, yeah, those those are those are going and then you're just writing and speaking and uh, doing all that stuff. So. All right. Good. How about you, Jacob? How's Heritage Council? Uh, going well, Harry. Uh, thanks for asking. And had a busy uh, a few weeks. I uh, just got back from Santa Cruz, Mount Hermon, where I was. Uh, I spoke to over 250 adults and youth on the topic of identity. Um, calling. Mm. And the, the main theme was God and culture. I also spoke to the parents on the topic of um, how they can resist the inroads of, you know, the, the cultural, what challenges that they are facing, their children are facing. So grateful for that. Um, uh, next week, I'll be actually, that's why I'm not joining you and mm -hmm. uh, Lenny. Um, next week, I'll be speaking at a, another retreat uh, uh, called Polly, which is in uh, Big Bear. Mm. Uh, and I'll be speaking more on the unity in the church. Mm. The titles are Better Together, Cultivating a Mindset of Unity and Building Together, Joining God in His Work. Mm. So looking forward to that, grateful for all the opportunities and yeah. what God is accomplishing through the ministry. A lot of what you mentioned, it looks like we're going to be talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. That's good. Like, what is God doing in the world, right? Yeah, and I get really to, excited yeah. with this topic of culture. I think <laughs> yeah. um, there is so much that we can redeem yes. uh, for the glory of God. Yes, yes. I'm excited too. In fact, we're so excited that we decided to be part of another organization that is focusing on church and culture, really. Yeah. Yeah. Church, culture, and politics. It's it's more that... so. We're more, there's an apologetics theme to what we're doing. The uh, Kirkwood Center, that's the name of the new uh, organization we're part of, which you can check out the website, right? What is yes. it again? Kirkwood, uh, KirkwoodCenter.org. Yeah. There you go. So check it out. Lots of content right now. But would either one of you mention kind of like the main uh, vision behind that? Like what, what, what are we trying to do? with that organization? So the, the full name is the Kirkus Center for Ethics and Theology. Uh, so that, that's, that's our focus in terms of uh, also bridging the gap between the church and the academia mm. and helping uh, the church leaders really understand where we are as a culture, uh, doing proper analysis of where we are and also advocating um, in terms of what we should be as Christians and uh, preparing ourselves to be good evangelists in this world, evangelizing the culture it's as well. It's equipping yeah. the church. Yeah, we're yeah. church-focused yeah. exactly. on this. Yeah. We want to awaken uh, what is there and what we feel the church ought to be doing. Yeah, and there's a need, actually, for us to also uh, bridge that gap between academia and church because there's. Sure. it seems like they are two separate realms right now. Church is doing its own thing. The academia is doing its own thing. I think there's, an, there's so much good that we can bring them together. Yeah. Uh, and um, really be able to actually speak into some of the major issues we are facing in culture today. Sure. And it wasn't too long ago where that was more unified. Yes. In fact, a lot of the most, a vast majority of Ivy League universities, colleges came from the church. It was an Yeah, they were seminaries. Yeah. yeah. And it's two-way. You know, we need to realize that uh, these institutions are an ex should be an extension of the church. Yeah where we prepare leaders that go and position themselves in various churches. At the same time, the church has a responsibility to speak into these institutions as well. So it's two-way yeah, in right. that regard. And I think if we, if we dissect them in a way that they are separate entities, I think there is so much of value that we're going to lose. Yeah. Okay. Agreed. Well, the number to call, again, uh, our topic for this evening, we're introducing a brand new series called Does the Church Play a Role in Culture Change? And if you want to chime in with your comment or question, the number is 888-995-5552.
or uh, one way to remember that is 888-995, which is the station on your dial, KKLA. Give us a call. We want to know what your church is doing in terms of trying to impact culture. It's not uncommon to hear parishioners say, oh my goodness, things are just looking bad. Culture is changing. I don't know what it is. I can't put my thumb on it, but it's it's different, you know. Uh, and I've been hearing that over and over again. So tonight we want to help you understand some of that, perhaps what the proper role of the church is, and um, we we are, in some ways, we lament the fact that um, we're, we're not so active in, in that regard in terms of our sensitivities with culture and church. Like, what we do in church actually is either part of making culture or a result of good culture, but if you have bad churches, in my opinion, you'll have a bad culture. It's as simple as that. Uh, so, why don't we, gentlemen, let, let's, let's unpack this. What do we mean by culture? And then we'll talk about church later. But what, what do we, we mean by culture? Well, I think uh, one of the problems in our modern understanding of culture is we've devalued the very idea of culture in common parlance. So when people will talk about their family culture. Our, and that can mean anything from we like to open our gifts on Christmas Eve or, you know, you have, one has to have tamales uh, or it's not Christmas. That, that, that is a prevalent concept. That, that's, a, that's our part of our culture. And part of, or it could be our heritage, our, our, the, those trappings, those ideas that um, kind of define us uh, that are actually superfluous. They're not necessarily fundamental they're 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 the outworkings the, the the outer signs of of years of development but they're not the most they're not the key things they're not the primary things when we talk about culture we're actually talking about the primary things so it's it's the way i see culture is we're talking about the central shared values and beliefs by the majority of individuals in a society and those shared values and beliefs have an expression, an outward expression, an outworking in the laws and the various values that the society takes on. So, for example, it is our culture in the United States to praise the individual, hard work, Puritan work ethic. Um, you can get ahead. You can be president if you want, you know. And if somebody were to come up to you and as an American and say, you know what? Uh, you, you were born into this level and you'll never get out of that level, that would be so shocking to you. You'd say, no, that's completely wrong. I can't even wrap my head around how people would believe in such a thing. But in the Indian culture, that's very un well understood, the, the, the whole idea of a caste. So, so culture is something more deeply embedded. It's, it's the outlook working of our shared values and beliefs. And uh, individualism is one of those things. Democracy, nobody, you know, if, no, we, we would be much better if we were ruled by a monarchy, right? right? It, just, it, it, just, it just rubs everything that makes America, America the wrong way. So that, that's what we mean by culture. You know, it's, it is the expression of those things that most people hold in common. Right, right. I mean, we can even say words like apple pie, and it has uh, a, con a certain connotation yeah. that means beyond food, right? Right. Uh, those kinds of things, or picnics, yeah. uh, potlucks. So, but it, yeah. what's interesting is uh, so, sometimes uh, people misunderstand these things. When I go speak outside of the state, so I was in Nebraska, and uh, I've heard this from folks when I go to Tennessee and other areas, th they find out I'm from California. And I would say 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the question was, wow, have you ever seen any movie stars? You know, <laughs> yeah. that was usually what right. Now everybody says the same thing. It's like, how can you live there? <laughs> <laughs> right. How can you even stand it? And, and I'm right. trying to explain to them, well, you have to understand that it's not like the governor is on my mind 24 mm. hours a day and that I'm faced with his choices. Right. Two things are, are, are true. First of all, 
I live my day-to-day life with people who I have shared values with for the most part. And that's true in Nebraska. Nebraska isn't, or Tennessee isn't immune to say the transgender issue. They don't, it's not that they don't have anybody pushing those ideologies out there either. Uh, But it's just, you know, how you live your day to day is different than, than what the pressures are upon changing the culture from external sources. Right. Uh, and, and I would say uh, that there are different, the beauty about culture is that it can, we can come to culture defining it from different angles. Yeah. Right? Um, uh, first of all, I would say we have to set our premises clear that God is the author of culture. He is the one who calls his image bearers to be cultivators. The very yes. term culture comes from that. That's why we call it agriculture. Mm-hmm. Right? right? So I believe when God calls us to cultivate uh, he's not telling us to, he's not giving us the tools or he's not making the tools to cultivate. He's expecting man to do that, right? So that includes within the very culture, the yeah, aspect the of culture broadly. Of, yeah. But there's another way of coming to it, which I really love. One of my favorite definitions of culture is by Cornelius Van Til. Religion is, uh, culture is religion externalized. And Joseph Booth said this, the word culture may best be understood as the public manifestation of the worship of a people. Mm. Mm. Right? I like that. Uh, so Why don't I you th- unpack that? Yeah. Uh, re- religion externalized. So, so we have to understand that what is it that we have give reverence to in our life? And that comes to a point that it even moves our whole being into creating things. Sure. Uh, creating family, creating tools that we work with, creating languages, as you yeah. said. Uh, if you go all the way back, God is the author of all those things, but he gives us that as his vice regents, Mm -hmm. the authority and the power to cultivate that and to use that towards a goal. What's happening in our culture is that it is disoriented. It is not oriented. That's why we need to be, even with missions, missions don't exist because we want to just go and just proclaim something. Missions exist because there's no worship, Mm -hmm. as John Piper said. Yeah, that's a Piper thing. We go and uh, plead people and compel them to come to or orient towards their creator God, who is the ultimate author of the culture that we should be abiding by. That's why yeah. I always say that uh, as Christians, there is something called gospel culture. Mm-hmm. Though we have these sub- subcultures like Indian culture and American culture or right. European culture, it, we can have those diversity in those cultures but still be united because there's a gospel culture that brings us together. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and it shows how culture can change uh, as well, especially the, the idea of worship. So let me give yes. an, a, a good example to the audience of how culture has shifted, even within our lifetimes. When we were growing up 70s in the 80s, there were certain words that you couldn't say in polite company, mm. and most uh, media would avoid them, right? They're, they're, they're curse words. Most of these curse words dealt with some aspect of reproduction, bodily function. Those were the, and why did we not say them? Because we recognized that there was a penchant within humanity to succumb to the appetites of sexual temptation. And we also recognize that so doing made us less human. It made us, it made us further from the image of God. Uh, you know, you're just acting like a beast, yeah. right? That has changed. And now the worst curse word, right? The, 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 mm-hmm. as, as it says in Christmas story, the, the queen mother of all curse words, the, right? The one he gets <laughs> his mouth washed out for, uh, is no longer that one that begins with an F, but it's one that begins with an N. Now, why was that word, which in the 70s, if you watched, say, All in the Family or the Jeffersons or, was, or even Blazing Saddles, was used liberally. Yeah. Throughout mm-hmm. media now is completely taboo, so much so that nobody wants to say it, even though they'll they'll use the F word mm-hmm. repeatedly in their story. Types. So what changed? What what are we worshiping now? We worship the sex and we worship the individuality yeah. and bigotry is considered evil because it denies the 
heritage and individuality of the individual, right? It, it strips you yeah. and denigrates where you're from as an individual. You, you touch on something very important. And just like, you know, people who argue that, oh, I'm so spiritual, I'm not religious. Yeah. They don't understand that religion is spirituality with parameters. Right. You have to be asking what are the right parameters. With culture, culture is also with parameters. Mm -hmm. Every culture has certain parameters mm -hmm. and it is set by the, the the God they worship. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The worldviews that they hold. I know that you don't like that word, but uh, <laughs> we'll yeah. talk more about exactly. that. Exactly. But but the word cult comes from that. It it gets that yes. sense where yes. it, it's a veneration of a higher being. Uh, so uh, the other one I wanted to contribute to that is uh, another old English word, colonists, where we get the word colonization, mm -hmm. which I know that's a bad word nowadays, but really what it means it's it's to inhabit. And so again, when God created us in his image. I know we talk a lot about rationality as part of that image, but it could be said that maybe a bigger trait that we ha we've inherited from, from God is his ability to rule. Yeah. So th that could be one way that we could understand uh, created in God's image is that he has endowed us with abilities to rule, to inhabit, uh, where we get col colonists. So, so yeah, we get, uh, I think... Guys, we, we got a, a, a good uh, definition of, of uh, culture here. I, I want to volunteer Andy Crouch's definition and Oz Guinness's definition. I like them both. So Andy Crouch says, culture is what human beings make of this world. To me, the word make is significant because it's, it's about making things. It's about creating things, uh, whether that, like you mentioned, language or art or whatever. Um, it, it comes out of our creativity. Uh, I, I like Oz Guinness, you know, he says, it's a way of life lived in common. Again, uh, to your point, Lenny, it's it's something that extends beyond us. So you can't be by yourself and have a culture. Right. You need more than one person. So, all right, so that's culture. I think we, we have a good idea of what it is. So uh, I'm reminded like grapes could be God's creation, but wine is culture mm -hmm. it's man's creation so hopefully that's helpful now uh, and and, and yeah. i would say the 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 end result of culture is civilization ah so 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 when man makes things what he leaves as a visible attribute of that are the buildings and the artwork and the right this is what what binds a civilization together when we talk about the greek civilization we look at the parthenon and the and the statues as well as um plato aristotle and and the works that they left us homer and such like that so their civilization the is the end result of the culture in which they live. And when that culture changes, the civilization crumbles. This is true of Rome when uh, it be moved from a republic to um, empire, when it moved from the empire to uh, a despotism and a, and a uh, really a licentious uh, oligarchy, and it then just fell apart. And so civilization crumbles so what would we, when we're talking about culture we're really talking about the destiny of us of our civilization mm. and like i said obviously even from the 70s to today we're seeing a radical shift has happened in our culture which means our civilization is now starting to reflect that we yes. see sexual aspects where where everybody and everything is gauged even individually through sex issues right it's it's all about the pelvis yeah. it's like you know who, who do you, uh, well how do you identify well why do you even want to under ask that question why is that pertinent to who i am as a human being right you know uh, but but that's how people engage one another today and i like what you said there lenny it's almost like if you see a culture or, or a civilization as it is right now you could almost reverse engineer it right. and then find its sources for, for how that culture or civilization is. So therefore, if you have a culture that is uh, embracing critical race theory ideas or wokeness or uh, uh, gender dysphoria type issues, you could go back 
maybe a generation or two and find out the cause for those kinds of things, right? right? And and would we accept those? Is the question that is the question? So that's where some of the analysis takes place. I mean, this might be very controversial to say, but we have it. to understand <laughs> that if we believe that cultures do have a standard that leads to creating civilization, right. then we have to agree with the fact that cultures are in spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. Not all cultures are in the same footing that's when right. it comes Absolutely. to morality, when it yeah, comes to not, issues. They're not equal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That is something that we have completely diluted. And right. that's totally controversial that in, in, in intercultural studies, for exactly. sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I know dear Christian brothers and sisters who would actually, like, bristle at that. Yeah. How, no such thing. No. Cultures, they, they would say cultures are, are all good. They're so, all so, good. Uh, yeah. So what, I, what it does is that I, I do understand the idea of contextualization when it comes to gospel, right? Bringing the gospel culture. But the danger is when we actually buy into that idea that all cultures are at the same level, we start synchronizing. Yeah. That's where gospel turns into what the culture looks like, right. not the other way around. Well, if everything is just the same, then how do you differentiate between good and bad? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And obviously there way. are, uh, obviously there's a difference between loving your neighbor and eating them, right? <laughs> and this is why we need to understand there's a push yeah. to actually remove all set kind of boundaries. Right. Yeah. Because when we bought into that idea that all cultures are kind of like same, when it comes to you know how they work out, then you have to adopt this idea of removing all set of restrictions and boundaries. Like you're saying, parameters. You're removing exactly. the parameters, like the guide rails. Exactly. So it's not everything goes, because if everything goes, then we have just chaos, Yes. madness. Well, I hear the music, which means we are up on a station break. Uh, you are listening to apologetics.com, where we challenge believers to think and thinkers to believe. We will be right back after a few words from our sponsors. Welcome to the uh, second uh, half hour of the Apologetics.com radio show, where we challenge believers to think and thinkers to believe. I'm Harry Edwards, your host for the evening, and join me, joining me in the studio are my good friends Lenny Esposito and Dr. Jacob Daniel. So we have begun a, 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 a new series titled, Does the Church Play a Role in Culture Change? And the first half hour, we tried our best to define what culture is, and so the second hour, we want to define what the church is. But if you want to connect with us and chime in, join us in our discussion. By the way, we're live, so we are accepting calls. Uh, we haven't done that in a while, gentlemen, but mm. we, we want to hear from you. Uh, are you going to a church that uh, is culturally sensitive? Uh, in whatever way you understand that, that question, uh, do you seek to change culture or do you seek to remain distant from culture because it, it, there's a, there are negative effects perhaps that you perceive? Uh, so what are your views on that? Um, maybe if you're a pastor, if you're a church leader, we'd love to hear from you. The number is 888-995-5552. Again, that's 888-995-5552. Give us a call. So, gentlemen, what is the church? Hopefully this is an easier uh, uh, exercise this time than culture. Possibly. Yeah, <laughs> possibly. That's true. What is the church? Well, there's there biblically you have two ways that the word ecclesia, which is translated church, is used. Mm -hmm. One is um, speaking of specifically a group of believers in some local area. <clears throat> the church at Ephesus, mm -hmm. the church at Thyatira, the Church of Galatia, for example. Those are specific groups of believers together in one locale. But beyond that, and more generally, the word ecclesia is used for those followers of Jesus who are in the world trying to um, move the world in his direction. So in Matthew 16, 18, you know, I, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So how is he building his church? Of course, uh, Matthew 28, you have the very famous, uh, you know, go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That's how he's, he, it, so they're disciples. They're, they're followers of Christ. Uh, those, that's the, the kind of, bigger understanding that there's the universal church of of true believers who have been changed 
uh, through a salvific experience and are now sharing in this newness of life and therefore are trying to, at the best of their ability, follow Christ and get back to that cultural goal of modeling Jesus in their lives in this world. Uh, before I define church, let me just correct myself. I said Cornelius Van Til. It was Henry Van Til. Oh, Henry said, Van Til. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, religion externalized. So, um, yeah, church, um, uh, the scripture gives us a beautiful picture of a body with a head, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the body is the followers of Christ and ch uh, Christ being the head, right? It's it's a unit of, uh, a unit of a person that Christ completes. And church is also the agent of the kingdom of God, as you mentioned, right? We are here to represent that kingdom. That's why we can pray as a church, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We are commissioned people by our master, the king, who said all authority in heaven is given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, right. teaching them all that I have taught you mm -hmm. to. So church is a commissioned body that, that, that has the responsibility as the ambassador of that king to bring the proclamation of his good news to the world. And in so doing, we are also the salt of the earth and light of the world, right? Church is also the pillar of truth. That's what the scripture says, right? Christ is that the ultimate light. He's the ultimate truth, but it is through the church that he represents, or the church represents the Christ in this world. Yeah. And represents Christ actually to those who would um, oppose God. Ephesians 3.10 has a very fascinating passage where Paul is talking about why he is going to the Gentiles. It says he's trying to convert people into living a godly life so that, in verse 10, in order that the many-sided wisdom of God might be made known now to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places, hmm. in order, uh, accord, um, through the church, according to the purpose of the ages which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. So making a th those ideas known in the heavenly places through the church, it reminds me very much of Job chapter 1, where God says to Satan, hey, have you considered my servant Job, a righteous man who is living on the earth and there's none more righteous than he? And the devil challenges him in that, right? Mm -hmm. And says, mm -hmm. well, that's because you've put a hedge of protection around him and everything he has. And God said, okay, mm -hmm. let's give it a shot. You know, take, take his stuff and see what happens. And Job stays faithful to God and God brags on him again. So, it's that's the part of the role of the church is to show those rulers and authorities in the heavenly places through righteous living. And then Paul goes on and, you know, therefore I exhort you to live in a manner worthy of the calling in which you were called with all humility and gentleness, right? That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to express this love to one another because it makes a point, not merely to the rulers and authorities of this world, which very much we were supposed to do, just as Israel was supposed mm -hmm. to do in the Old Testament. They were supposed to be an example to call others, yeah. but also to uh, the heavenly places. Okay, very good. So if we understand uh, the church then to be uh, like an extension of, of kind of like God's heavenly program here on earth. Yes. And he has called us uh, to subdue it, respons to have responsible dominion over it. Remember, we talked about some aspects of culture where it suggests that uh, there's some um, inhabiting that, that's part of that. Uh, so let me ask you guys a question. Let, let's say the church goes about its business of uh, proclaiming the gospel, making disciples of all nations. Do you think that activity can go without any culture change? Uh, you know what I'm getting yeah. at, right? Mm -hmm. Because it seems like, for many, uh, they divorce the two, mm. uh, meaning they go about their pious religiosity, or uh, let's say they're with all their hearts, they're doing the Great Commission. They're they're making disciples of all nations. Uh, and maybe starting with their with, with their locality, and then they have a mindset as as missions grow out. But but if they're not thinking about culture change, 
Where's the disconnect there? Uh, I think what we need to focus on is that when we talk about as Christians, when we talk about gospel, it's the gospel of the kingdom of God. There's a blueprint that's been given to us through the way of the scripture. So when we talk about changing culture or transforming culture, I use the term redeeming culture mm-hmm. because uh, uh, redeeming culture gives us that picture of an end, as you, you right. were saying, the telos, right? Uh, we have a blueprint that we follow. We orient and reorient our culture when, it, when it's changing, when it's transforming. It's not without a goal or an end in itself. So when we are saying, uh, what we are hoping is that, that the God's kingdom as we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we have to land that in terms of what Christ has taught us. That's our blueprint. Mm-hmm. And I think when that is implemented in a culture, the culture flourishes. And we have seen that through the way of various civilizations, even in the yeah. past, that Christianity has influenced. So what I would say is that I, sometimes we get this backwards. Sometimes we think that we are supposed to move the cultural needle through some kind of marketing program, some kind of uh, specific political domino effect or things like that. And I don't think that's right. I think that's what happens is the church changes lives. The church changes people. Jesus comes in and now you have a new way of looking at things. And because you have a new way of looking at things, when things don't conform to the image that God has, that's when you bristle and you naturally react to it. And because you naturally react to it, then you have a uh, kickback. So let me give you a couple of examples. You know, it, it, Telemachus is a primary example here um, where he, it's 404 AD and it, we, Rome has been Christianized for some 75 years, but the gladiatorial combats are still going on. Telemachus is a bishop from the east who mm. wanders into town, notices these guys fighting to the death in order to merely amuse the the citizens of the city. And he jumps into the arena and he says, hey, these people are made in the image of God. This should not be, right? He's just reacting viscerally to what he understands is an abridgment of, of the holiness of the individual. He's not trying to create some kind of political system. And the response of the crowd, of course, was, hey, what are you doing interrupting our fun? Mm. And they have him killed. They, they, they throw stones at him and, and slay him but for doing so. Yet the emperor hears of this, and by the next year, he bans gladiatorial combat across the Roman Empire. See? Mm. So the culture changed because an individual saw an affront and reacted in the same way as as like i said if you were to see her someone use the n-word today it's going to cause a very different reaction to anyone who hears it than it did and matter of fact in the 70s you play any of those shows from the 70s and 80s and my children get very uncomfortable because Mm -hmm. they can't put it in that context they Mm -hmm. just have no and they how can you even have watched this right so that that's the way it's not that we seek to change culture as our mission in and of itself. It's that we seek to live a life, a godly life for yeah. Christ. And what will naturally outflow from that is care for our brothers, right? Mm-hmm. The other way that the other famous um, way that culture was changed was in the in the one sixties when there was a, a, a heavy plague in Rome, and all of the aristocracy was leaving town, but the Christians were coming in because. They understood hospitality. They understood the parable of the Good Samaritan. And even if it's my enemy, I come in and I nurse him. And that's what they did. So the people who were left to die, I mean, literally, if, if your uncle had the plague, you were still going to your villa out in the outskirts of the, uh, of the country, and you're leaving him to fend for himself. And, but the Christians were coming in and nursing these guys back to health. Did Christians die? Yes. That's what selflessness looks like. But at the same time, two things happened. The Christians who got immune remained and were strengthened, and the people who survived remembered that and were more amenable to the Christians, and that strengthened the church in total. And the church grew. And the church grew because of that. And when we talk about cultural change, we need to understand that it's a process. Yes. Right? So we should be understanding where we are in the culture. Maybe it's a time to actually till the soil of the cultural 
you know, mm-hmm. the milieu in which we are living, that it might be a time to nourish the culture, yeah. you know, so that we may not actually lose it, right? It is rightly directed, rightly oriented. At the end, the goal is worship, right? What is it that our culture is worshiping at the end? Who is it honoring? Who is it directed to? And as a church, we have a mandate to teach all things Mm -hmm. to all people at all times and bringing them them to the knowledge and reconciling them, pleading them to reconcile with God, who is their creator. So let me ask maybe an uncomfortable question. And let's connect the dots. So if I were maybe a skeptic or seeker, and I'm listening to the show, right? So you've we they've heard uh how, how we've defined culture they've heard that uh church is tied to culture can someone say they look at culture today here in the west and it's not doing very well mm. can we look to the church for some some blame perhaps or is the church asleep at the wheel or it, what what are you guys' thoughts on that so if Maybe the church has lost agree. its saltiness yeah. and light. I would agree, okay. yes. We have abandoned our post. We've not been good gatekeepers. But having said that, we would also make the claim with confidence that it is this church that can redeem it. That's right. Right? Yeah. So church has the tools necessary to till the cultural soil. Uh, we've not been doing a good job. Yes, we accept our failure. Mm-hmm. But to say that, um, what we would say is that, it is the church that has to take the responsibility and move forward, strengthen itself, understand the world that we're living in, and offer what Christ has offered us. So give me some examples. Where have we been asleep at the wheel, so to speak? Well, I think, what do you think? I think it's harder and harder to differentiate. There, there, there's less and less of a contrast between the church and the world today. Individualism is, for example, one aspect that has permeated our churches where people— will go to a church based on whether it suits their needs. As a consumer. Yeah. It's a consumer view of church. And many of them will say, oh, I, you know, it's, it's just too much for me to actually get up and go. I, I'll just watch it online. And this is, this is in direct contradiction to the biblical admonition, right? Do not forsake the gathering right. of yourselves right, together right. because watching it online is not going to church. Listening to podcasts is not going to church. So, but we we fall into that. And what's fascinating is there was a recent article that uh, Barna started um, analyzing the nuns and what were causing the nuns to be nuns. And many of the nuns actually still held to traditional and let's beliefs. Be, let's be clear, nuns, N-O-N-E-S. N-O-N-E-S, yeah, the, yes. Meaning uh, no affiliation. They, they have no specific religious affiliation, affiliation yes. with, a, with a specific church yeah. entity. But many of them would, would claim that they believe Jesus is God's son, they believe in God, uh, they're just not practicing anything specifically, and they found the primary moving, uh, the primary motivator in that was not lack of belief or intellectual. It wasn't that because they went to college. It was lack of community, mm-hmm. lack of community. And how do you get community? Well, you have to abandon some of this individuality. You have to bond together. You have to put the group dynamic ahead of self dynamic. It's not, what do I need to achieve my next level of spiritual awakening? It's, what can I do to help others see Christ better? How can I, how can we live life together? And we, I was just talking about this with some friends uh, this evening. It's, you know, small groups, uh, they're okay, but they're still an appointment-driven experience. They're still, you know, Wednesday nights from 7 to 8.30, and then that's not living life together. Church was understanding that we come together as a body, and if one part of the body is in pain, then the whole mm. body is in pain. And I think what yeah. we've done is that actually we have somehow relegated our authority to institutions outside. Yes, absolutely. That's been, and that has done damage to our household. Hey, give me an bro- example. Uh, g- g- for example, we, we, uh, what about older people? We have older institutions taking care of them, right? What about the education of our children? 
public school taking care of that yeah. and educating them, catechizing them, right? Churches, we have relegated the shepherding role to youth pastors. Mm -hmm. And the evangelism role. <laughs> I'll, I'll right. just bring them to church and let my pastor tell them the gospel. That's right. Exactly. So these are some of the ways in which we have broken the family structure, the very basic unit. Right. right? A nation is formed, a community is formed with these units right. coming together. We're not living things in common anymore. It's exactly. silos. Yeah. You're right. Uh, so, so that radical individualism that has crept into yeah. the church, into the family, has done a major damage. So we need to bring back those, the, the idea of community back, the yeah. righteous community that the scripture prescribes. And, so, yeah. and one of the communities that we talk about, that we're talking about, is the church itself. Yes, yes. So I know we talked about this during the break, but um, COVID, the pandemic, when it happened, it exposed certain things about the church. Like I said, it, it kind of stretched the limit of what we know as community, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. uh, But can you guys think of certain things that maybe the church somehow, did they lose courage perhaps or abdicated certain roles during the pandemic? And uh, how do you see the church regain some of those things that it has lost? I mean, obviously, almost every institution, everybody lost something during the pandemic. But uh, we also know that there were some courageous yeah. churches that yeah. said, no, we are, again, God's bastion of goodness and grace here, and we will not abandon our posts. Well, I, I do yeah. want to be a little careful, sure. because in the early stages of the pandemic, we were getting a lot of information very quickly from uh, sources that we would normally have considered reliable, yeah. who are talking about the extreme danger uh, the uh, your congregants could you know and there was there was of course the um, individual examples of the like the by the choir uh -huh. who met in oh, Washington yes. State who <laughs> met and everybody caught sure COVID. sure that's um, good to point out you know and and so so some pastors were legitimately trying to protect hmm. their congregation by as saying they okay, should as they hmm. should yeah um, and you know Martin Luther made a point about this when the bubonic plague was raging he said you know hey if don't be foolish you know off take up the protections that you need to take up but if you my brother is in need of food then your obligation is to go to your brother and provide him food because he's stricken in bed with a plague mm -hmm. uh, you know and and so luther had written on this uh, very explicitly uh and the problem is is that because church had already been a destination and for our personal fulfillment as opposed to uh, an intricate part of life uh then it would it was easier to unplug and i think um, you use the right term harry i think covid did expose us yeah that we were already divided right we were not uh, we didn't have common doctrine that we stood or believed in, right? Churches yeah, the church were, was divided. The church was divided. Uh -oh, that was just yeah. an exposure yeah. of the fact that was the case, right? right? So I think in one sense, in my understanding, the, this sifting has been good. Mm -hmm. It has woken up the church, mm -hmm. a good number of churches and believers, and they have realized what is it that they have taken for granted. Mm -hmm. So in one sense, in God's providence, I would say this judgment against the church or against the nation or the culture uh, has been productive in that there are parents and there are pastors, there are leaders who are waking up. And I think they'll react differently. I want to be optimistic. Yeah. I hope they'll be different the next time it comes yeah. around. Well, sure. and, and again, form. even with yeah. even with family, I think people found out um, just how difficult, yeah, when, when folks were barred from seeing their parents in the yeah. hospital you know, or, or, or attending funerals or things like that, they really found out just how valuable family was as opposed to other aspects of life, which they may not have in better times yeah. understood as well. Uh, wh right. While we talk about the jurisdiction of the church, I think with this uh, um, you know, ins like pandemic or whatever you want to call it, we have realized, oh yeah, the state does have certain jurisdiction as well. Yeah. So they've been, you know, they've been sure. invading the jurisdiction of the church Absolutely. for a long time. Uh, so I think this has woken up a lot of people, and they're realizing that oh, we need to 
understand what true resistance is, yes. righteous resistance, because we are not anarchist. We are called to respect the government when it submits to the law of God and wields the sword that's been given to them, that's, the sword of that's justice. That's really important, yeah, because because it did. And, and um, for example, government programs for feeding the poor yeah. and things of that nature. That was the Where job was the and church? the purview of the church. Church, exactly. Where is the church? Why yeah. aren't we opening up our, saying that we are to open up our church and take care of people who are suffering? Well, here's here's yeah. an example. For example, uh, this is, you know, this would be a fascinating aspect. Now, I'm part of a church plant, and, and you want to let people know, of course, you're a small church, you want to let it grow. And so uh, there's, there's advertisements that you can make. There's postcards that you can send out. There's signs that you can hang. Hey, come, come listen to us on Sunday morning. Come join us. What if instead of that, you said, hey, young parents, Come bring your kids on Friday night. So we value marriage so much that we want you guys to have a date night. And we understand that, you know, rent on an apartment today is like $3,000 a month. You're probably scraping by to make ends meet. We will give you absolute free child care for one night a month. If you, you know, come and bring your kids to us. Mm -hmm. You think that would attract people to your church on Sunday morning as well? And I also want to give the credit where it is due. During the pandemic time or the COVID times, imagine if there was no church in a society like the Western world that is so individualistic right. compared to the other uh, other side of the world, right? Imagine if we didn't have the 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 presence of churches and how they have counseled people mm. how they have ministered to individuals who've really suffered through this yes. right imagine yeah. that too so yeah. i, I want to give credit to the church as well sure they've, sure they've been faithful in taking care of their people as well we could have done more we could have definitely done more but at the same time we have done a good good right. you know we're taking the responsibility well, I, I would think so if faithfully. the abortion issue is a, is a very good example of where the church is at least the conservative church is very unified in its um, understanding of human life and human value it, it's 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 not nearly as divisive i mean there are individuals in some churches who hold that uh, differences, but for the most part, if you're uh, a, a Bible believing church, you, you you come down on the same side of this issue. So there's a there's a good example. It's not like the church is completely lost, and it and it and that is where the church is changing culture. Not because it generates political action groups; mm -hmm. those are separate, but because of the beliefs that they hold, it's just the natural outworking. Yeah. Of yeah. That. No, I know we have just two minutes left, guys. So. Uh, before we end, though, any final advice to church leaders or pastors out there uh, in terms of our topic tonight? Uh, I, I think we all agree that churches are responsible for culture change toward the gospel. I mean, that's just basic. Any last-minute thoughts? Uh, I would say you can't fight sword with a stick. Mm. So you can't fight culture with something else but culture. The question is what, right? because there is a hijacked culture, a counterfeit culture, and there's a true culture as we are seeing the gospel culture. So we have to bring the right perspective and we can do that by reorienting people as to what they are worshiping and offering them the true culture, the gospel culture without diluting it and being bold and being faithful. I think we need to be strong in our conviction that we stand on. And with God's help, we can do what Christ said. He is building the church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I've never seen any gates attacking us. Right. We are called to attack the gates and Christ has promised, promised us that they shall not prevail against it. Okay. So in his apology, Tertullian writes to the emperor and he makes the case that look at how these people live. You know that they are the most uh, virtuous of your citizenry, you know you you know that you can't castigate us on our honesty. You know that you can't castigate us on our work ethic. You know that we share all things in common. You even know that it's worse for us, our women, to be thrown into the brothel than to be thrown to the lions because they don't value their lives above Christ, but they do value their morality. That's how moral we are. So uh, he worked to change culture by showing 
the the purity and the beauty of the Christian culture lived out. And I think that's a, a key issue. The other thing I would say is tune in next week because that's probably what we're going to be talking about mostly next week is yes. how the church can actually forward these projects. Yes. Good. Well, you've been listening to the Apologetics.com radio show where we challenge believers to think and thinkers to believe. Our hope is that you've learned some aspect about the Christian worldview that strengthens your faith and make you want to learn more. And by more, I meant like uh, our topic tonight, you know. So special thanks to my panel this evening, to Jacob and Lenny, to our behind-the-scenes sound engineer, and special thank you to your listeners. So until next time, good night.